Hey everybody, Bob Olson here with Afterlife TV. You can find us at AfterlifeTV.com. This is where we search for evidence of life after death and ask the meaningful questions around that subject. Uh, today we're going to be talking about your soul, uh, specifically the gift that your soul has given you. And a little hint about that is we'll be talking about the healing power of pre-birth planning. Uh, we have a guest who's really been brought back by popular demand. I, I, I think I've had more questions regarding the interview that I have done with this guest than, than with anybody else. And, and I think it's because it's such a deep subject and such a complicated subject and such a meaningful subject. So I'm so happy to have you back. Uh, Robert Schwartz, thanks for coming back. You're welcome, Bob. It's a pleasure to be back. Do you mind if I call you Rob? Rob is great. Yeah, okay. Um, I, uh, I will let everybody know right away that we're talking about your second book. Your first book was Your Soul's Plan, uh, and there's going to be a video underneath this one that people can watch if they want to watch that one first, okay? So that'll be our first interview. Uh, the second one is this here, Your Soul's Gift, all right? And it's about the healing power of pre-birth planning. Uh, specifically, the title, subtitle says, The Healing Power of the Life You Planned Before You Were Born. So very cool. Both of these books are amazing, life-changing. I know I, I've had, I can't even imagine how many people have told you this, but I've had so many people tell me that your books, your Thank work you. has changed their life. Why don't we just start off with um, you defining what pre-birth planning is, and then if you can sort of explain the big picture message uh, that is the basis of your work. Sure, I'd be happy to. Let me just say first, uh, I do have a website at YourSoulsPlan.com, and anybody who would like to can read a large excerpt of both books for free on that website. Cool, uh, very cool. Pre-birth planning is the process by which we and our souls uh, plan a life before we come into physical body. Now when I say we and our souls, that's a little bit misleading but because it implies that there's a distinction or a separation between you and your soul and really there is no separation but because of the limits of language I'm going to have to talk about it in those terms. So the way pre-birth planning works as I understand it is that a person's soul and here I'm defining soul as a spark of God, a portion of God's energy plans uh, before coming into body to incarnate in a certain time period, uh, in a certain physical location, in a certain body, with a certain family, and then to have certain experiences over the course of a lifetime. The pre-birth plan is created by the soul in consultation with God, spirit guides, angels, what we would call ascended masters. Then, once the plan is in place, the soul creates the personality, that would be you and me, who are going to be in body. So the personality is a spark of the soul, and the soul is a spark of God. Now once the personality is created, the personality is told what the plan is for the upcoming lifetime. At that point, you can do one of two things. You can either agree to the plan, which is what the vast majority of people do, or if you think that it's too much, you can express fear, doubt, worry, reservations. If you do that, then your guides and your soul will reassure you that the plan is for your highest and greatest good and for the highest and greatest good. During that process of being reassured, you will feel the tremendous love, the unconditional love of your guides and your soul. And the feeling of that love will reassure you that it really is for the highest good and at that point, the vast majority of people agree to the plan. But if you still have reservations and you still feel that it's too much, you can express them at that point. And if you do, then the plan is revised and modified and made a little bit easier. So that's essentially how it works. All right. And I'm curious. So you're talking about the highest good. Um, so I get the impression when you use the phrase highest good, that it's not just for that one personality or that even that one soul, it's for other souls as well. Is that true? Yes, that's my understanding, is that the pre-birth plan for any one individual serves the highest good of that individual, but also the highest and greatest good of all concerned. So you and the members of your family are in service to one another. You and your friends are in service to one another. 
you and pretty much everybody you meet over the course of a lifetime are in service to one another, even though it may not necessarily appear that way on the surface. Okay. And which sort of brings us to that second part of that question that I had, is the big picture message that is the basis of your work. All right. Well, you know, what is your work all about? Tell us. Tell us. The basic intent of the work is to help people see deeper meaning and deeper purpose in challenges which may appear on the surface not to have any deeper meaning or deeper purpose. In other words, I think we live at a, a point in linear time in which the average person, when something quote-unquote bad happens to them, they tend to feel victimized. Depending upon their beliefs, they feel that a punishing God is uh, punishing them in some way or that a cruel universe is punishing them in some way. Or at a minimum, they may simply not see any deeper meaning or purpose. It may seem like life is completely random and arbitrary and they're simply being buffeted about. Mm. Now, I don't believe that any of that is true. What my research shows for Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift is that, in fact, we ourselves plan our lives and agree to the plan prior to birth, as I described a moment ago. So the basic intent is that, to help people see deeper meaning and deeper purpose. Now, there's a more specific intent, which is to help people come out of victim consciousness. Victim consciousness is a tremendously low vibrational state. It's tremendously disempowering. If you believe yourself to be a victim, then you believe that to one degree or another you are helpless and powerless. And if you believe that, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, even though it isn't in fact true. So the idea here is that if you agreed to your life plan, you are the all-powerful creator of all that you experience. And once you know that, then it pulls you out of victim consciousness, which is tremendously empowering, and then you can go about creating in a much more conscious manner. Now, there's uh, an even more specific intent in the new book, Your Soul's Gift, which is to talk about the healing power of the life we plan before we're born. And people ask the question, well, if we plan great challenges that wound us, aren't we actually doing the opposite of healing? Aren't we actually hurting ourselves? And this is a very difficult concept to get at. But at the level of the soul, things that are wounding to the personality can catalyze great healing depending upon how the personality responds to the life challenges. Basically, if you respond with love, at the soul level it catalyzes profound healing. If you respond with fear, then in fact you are wounded and you will go on in a wounded state until you learn to respond in love. That's essentially how it works. But the idea here is that these great challenges that seem to hurt us actually can lead to very, very deep healing over a period of time. Mm. Uh, that's, that's profound. That's deep. Um, certainly makes sense when you say it, and then we try to apply it to our lives. Not so easy. I know, you know first of all, you know, both of your books um, give lots of examples and, uh, of this in action, and uh, and you talk about it many different subjects, so so that you know people can usually apply one of them to their lives, their situation, uh, and and I know you're going to give some examples as we go along, but um, so let me back up a little bit because you do talk about earlier you mentioned the relationship and the difference between the soul and its human counterpart, which you call the incarnating personality, right? So tell us a little bit about this relationship and the differences between them, because I'm sure that for some people this is, this is the hurdle that they're having trouble getting over. Like you said, we can only really talk about these things as if the soul were separate from us. You're certainly not saying that, as, as you already told us. So uh, tell us about that relationship a little bit more so we can understand that better. Well, you, the personality, that is everyone watching this conversation, you are a part of your soul. And you have access to all the love, all the wisdom, all the strength, and all the power of your full soul. But because the average person doesn't know that, in some ways they are veiled from it or separated from it. So many of your listeners will be familiar with the idea of the aura, which is sometimes further broken down into the emotional, mental, and spiritual bodies. These are the subtle bodies around the physical body. The aura or subtle bodies are essentially the soul acting as a container for the physical body. The soul contains the physical body and the personality. So you are never actually separate from your soul. In fact, you are always contained within it. Now, 
the soul has what you could call a certain divine virtues. This is a term that I've come to use. It essentially refers to qualities that are an inherent part of the soul. There are 30 or so divine virtues that come up again and again in my work. That is, when we see souls planning their lives, they talk about, in the pre-birth planning sessions, wanting to come into body for the purpose of cultivating and expressing these qualities or divine virtues. These are things like compassion, unconditional love, self-love, patience, empathy, gentleness, kindness, things like that. There are about 30 of them okay. that I see again and again. These are qualities that are part of the soul, and the soul wants to come into body in part to have the experience of cultivating them and expressing them on the physical plane. And one way to do this is through life challenges, because life challenges in many people have the effect of breaking the heart open, so to speak, and then, once the heart is open, the person is more kind, more gentle, more loving. This is a very difficult way to learn, but some souls learn best this way, and those souls tend to come to the earth plane for that type of learning. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I actually, I want to come back to that a little bit in a moment, um, that healing aspect that we talked about at the very beginning. But... Um, Actually, let's just jump right into that. You know, I think it's, it's I, I didn't want to go too deep too fast, but you've already done that because that's the essence of your work. And you, so you're kind of used to it and you okay. do it so well. I mean, uh, you, you've, you've, you've jumped right to the essence of, of all of this. And um, so let's talk about that. Um, how does understanding pre -birth plan, our pre-birth planning help us to heal? What's, what's this healing aspect of understanding the pre-birth planning process? Well, one of the things I, I do in my private counseling practice is uh, for something called a spiritual guidance session. And in these sessions, we often do an exercise which I refer to as the divine virtues exercise. So in the divine virtues exercise, I read the client the list of the 30 or so virtues that I was talking about a moment ago. They write them down the left-hand side of a piece of paper. And then across the top of the paper, I asked them to make category headings for one for everything that they consider to be a major life challenge. And then I asked them to go through the virtues one by one and for each life challenge, assign a numerical value indicating the extent to which that challenge helped them to cultivate or express. And it can be either one. They're equally important from the soul's viewpoint. Mm. Extent to which the life challenge allowed them to cultivate or express that particular divine virtue. So they end up filling out this very elaborate, complex sort of grid. By the time they're done, the average client will find that they've assigned consistently higher numbers to two or three of the divine virtues. That's because the average person is working on two or three of the virtues in a particular lifetime. I see. Occasionally, somebody is working on four or five. That would tend to be a very trauma-filled lifetime, and there aren't too many people doing that. Now, once you know what your two or three are, this is where the healing comes in, and it comes in both uh, retroactively and proactively. Retroactively, once you know which two or three virtues you're working on, then you can go back over the course of your life and see the deeper meaning and deeper purpose of the challenging things that have happened to you. So let's say that you go through this exercise and you realize you are here to cultivate and express uh, compassion, patience, and forgiveness you will start to see how the major challenges in your life up until now were opportunities for you to cultivate and express those three divine virtues. So whereas those challenges may have seemed random, arbitrary, meaningless, and you may have been bitter or angry about them, now that you see the deeper meaning, it's very healing because you can say, all right, this other person who challenged me, they were just playing a role that we agreed together before we were born. They were giving me, for example, an opportunity to cultivate and express forgiveness. And once you know that, then you actually can cultivate and express forgiveness for somebody in a much easier way. You can also have a lot more compassion for the person and for yourself. And so it, it really creates a, a great healing on an emotional level in regard to past challenges. Then it also helps proactively because once you know which two or three virtues you're working on, then in the future, when something challenging comes up, instead of not seeing a deeper meaning or purpose to it, you remind yourself, ah, okay, I am in this incarnation to cultivate and express 
compassion, patience, and forgiveness. In this current challenge in which I find myself, how can I utilize it to do that? And once you ask that question, it immediately assigns deeper meaning and purpose to the challenge. So it's no longer a random, arbitrary, meaningless event. It's something that is quite rich with meaning. And then you can go about learning the underlying lessons, in other words, cultivating those virtues, in a much more conscious manner. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, now I'm hearing myself. I hate when that happens. Um, you know, I, I think I said this in the last interview. I listen, I read, I read your words, and I think, oh man, what a great writer. And then, then you go and speak exactly the same way. It's just <laughs> it blows my mind. A bit envious. Um, so so well said. I, it brought up three questions for me. One is. Um, the 30 Divine Virtues, if people wanted to read what those were, which of your books talk gives the list of the 30 Divine Virtues? And it, it's actually not in either book, and that's okay. because I didn't, I didn't develop the list until the second book was out. That's what I thought, because I remember in our last interview you talked about that, and, and um, uh, maybe that would be something you'd want to put on your website at some, at some point, but I, I, I think the problem with that would be that people might be working with them and not really knowing how to do it properly. Is that, is that the case? Maybe? Well, that, that, that would be a, a concern of mine. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would mention though, uh, is that the 30 divine virtues is not intended to be an exhaustive list. There are many, many more qualities that we as souls come into body to cultivate and express, but these are the ones that I see most commonly in my work. In other words, working with the mediums and channels that I work with, uh, we go into people's pre-birth planning sessions, or we do channeling sessions in which we hear them, the souls talking about the purpose, the intentions for the upcoming lifetime, and these 30 or so are the ones that came up again and again. Okay. Uh, the second question that came up while you were talking uh, is, is it possible for our souls to miscalculate what we can handle in terms of challenges in one lifetime? Or, you know what I mean? Um, the, in our last interview we talked more about the idea of challenge our souls pre-planning the challenges in our lifetime and i wondered you know you said some people are here for one or two or three divine virtues others for more um any possibility we might you know have you know our eyes are bigger than our stomach kind of thing we just, we we set ourselves up for maybe possible failure well, that, that actually does happen, and it happens in, in a couple of ways. There are times where the soul itself takes on too much in the pre-birth planning process. And sometimes the spirit guides actually advise the soul, hey, you're, you're taking on a little bit too much here, you might want to tone it down. And if a soul is, is particularly, I'll use the word ambitious, although that's not quite accurate, but for lack of a better term, <laughs> if the soul is particularly ambitious for the upcoming lifetime, the soul can actually ignore the advice of the spirit guides and take on what turns out to be too much for the personality. Uh, but it also happens in a second way, which is that even if the guides and other beings who are advising the soul feel that the plan is a moderate one, it can still occur, and, and actually frequently does, that the incarnate personality responds to the plan challenges uh, out of fear rather than love, makes what you could call discordant or unloving decisions. And when that happens, it takes the person off the highest vibrational path for the lifetime. And it often has the effect of triggering more catalysts or more challenges, which can eventually overwhelm the personality. And so it actually is the case that some lifetimes will come to an end. Because the soul concludes, it will not be able to accomplish what it came to accomplish. And it's best simply to start over. Now, having said that, I want to point out, from the human perspective, it sounds like what I've just described would be a failure. And I can assure everyone listening today, your soul will not regard you as a failure. No matter what you do in a lifetime, there is absolutely no judgment of you by your soul or by your guides or by angels or masters or God. There may be self-judgment in the life review after the life is over, but you would be the only being who would have any judgment of how you lived your lifetime. Even if you don't accomplish what your soul had hoped for in the pre-birth plan, your soul is still deeply, deeply grateful to you for the courage you show by coming into body and living a physical lifetime on earth, which is not an easy thing to do. And even if you don't accomplish plan A, so to speak, you will still derive a lot of growth and learning out of the lifetime. Your soul will be deeply grateful to you for this. 
And so there simply is no judgment of the personality by the soul. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I said setting ourselves up for failure. And as soon as I said it, I knew failure was the wrong word. And so I'll thank you for bringing that up because in, in every area that I have uh, investigated uh, regarding the afterlife, um, that message is, is, is true all the way across the board. Nobody disagrees with that idea. Um, so the, th and the third question that came up while you were talking, uh, was the idea about this idea about, you know, is every person in our life part of our soul's plan? I wouldn't imagine they are, but uh, certainly significant ones. But uh, you tell me. Well, here it depends on your, your definition of plan. Um, if by plan you mean what was set up prior to birth, then the, the significant people, certainly, the answer to that is yes. And actually many of the minor people as well. In fact, there, there is something known as uh, a bump contract. And this term is used when you plan prior to birth to meet somebody just very, very briefly to bump you, so to speak, back on your primary path if you've gotten off it. And the way you know that, that you've encountered somebody with whom you have a bump contract is that it tends to be a very short relationship but a very intense one that has a profound impact on your life. Mm. So this person may only be there very, very briefly and yet that too is part of the pre-birth plan. Now, if by plan you mean sticking to the broader intentions that were set up prior to birth but maybe not the minute details of the pre-birth plan, then that encompasses actually a much greater number of people. And what I mean is this. We are all vibrational beings, and everybody knows about the law of attraction right now. So as I understand it, everybody who comes into your life is somebody that you have called into your life, attracted at some level, often not conscious. But your soul is very aware of everybody who's coming into and out of your life. And so there are modifications that are made to the pre-birth plan after you get into body, and they're implemented through your vibration. In other words, let's say that your pre-birth intention is to deepen in compassion. This would be a very common pre-birth intention. And let's say that for one reason or another, the people that you agreed to work on the, this lesson with prior to birth, um, whatever it is that they're doing with you and for you, despite their best efforts, you're still not getting the lesson. You're still not deepening in compassion. So at this point, your soul, in collaboration with the souls of other people, can bring new people into your life who will also, in one way or another, give you a nudge to learn compassion. So these may not be things that were set up before your incarnation, but they're true to the pre-birth intention, and in that sense, they're true to the pre-birth plan. Mm, okay. All right. You know, it's it's. I love this because you're covering so many of the questions that I had, but you know, obviously in a different order. But but then not exactly the way I uh, I had asked it. So you brought up this idea of intentions and 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 sort of this law of attraction uh, concept. And in thinking about that, you know, um, you know, so many people in our audience, you know, have learned and believe in the idea that. You know, what we think and what we feel and the things that we do send a message to the universe, of what we want, and we attract that into our lives, such as gratitude tells the universe that we want more of that in our lives, you know. Um, is there one that's more powerful over the other? Uh, just does a soul plan uh, for something to happen override the idea that we're you know this idea of the law of attraction or intentional attraction uh into our lives or do they always try to to work it out i would imagine they always try to work it out but if they if they're in contrast with, with one another what happens at that point well let's take a very simple example i mentioned earlier that the soul has the ability to incarnate in any physical location and at any time uh, another thing that the soul can do is to choose prior to birth to be born with some sort of physical handicap. So if you are a soul who chooses to be born in a location and at a point in linear time in which you have a certain physical handicap that you know at a soul level prior to birth can't be treated by medical science, then you're going to have that physical handicap short of what we would call a miracle. 
So if you're born with this physical handicap that can't be treated medically, as you grow up, you may learn about the law of attraction, the importance of gratitude, and so forth. And you might say to yourself, I would like to utilize these spiritual tools to heal my physical handicap. If the soul's pre-birth intention was that you, the personality, would have that physical handicap for most of your life or perhaps all of your life, mm -hmm. then the soul's intention will override the intention of the incarnate personality. And so you may practice using these tools, but the simple fact that you chose to be born in a time period in which medical science can't treat the handicap, mm -hmm. that's going to override law of attraction, the use of gratitude, and so forth. Now, having said that, the conscious use of the law of attraction, and in particular, the conscious use of gratitude, is a tremendously, tremendously powerful creational tool. And I don't want in any way to discourage people from using that. An analogy you might use here in order to understand this is that when you think about what you want, it's as though you're sending a black and white movie out into the universe, a picture of what you want, and you're asking, bring this to me. But when you feel what you want, and particularly when you feel gratitude for it, even before it's happened, then it's like you're beaming a full technicolor movie out into the universe. And you're saying, this is what I want, please bring it to me. So obviously the technicolor movie, so to speak, gives the universe a lot more information to work with. It's a much more complete picture and is much more likely, therefore, to manifest. So that's how gratitude is much more powerful than simply thinking about what you would like to have. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's right. Everything I've learned about it as well. You know, when you add feeling, when you add everything, when you f add feeling and action to what you're thinking, it just keeps magnifying as we go along. But then, of course, now we have... The grand question that you've heard a million times, I know, which is, you know, does pre-birth planning interfere with our free will? The, the answer to that question is no. And let me explain how that can be. Uh, let's say hypothetically, and this is a, a hypothetical story that I share in the book, Your Soul's Gift. Let's say that there is a soul who has had many incarnations in which they deferred to the wishes of others. So in the life review, this soul would see that they had a tendency to let other people tell them how to live their life and would be motivated to heal it. And by the way, this motivation to heal past tendencies, uh, past ways of doing things, this is a primary motivation for planning life challenges. Hmm. So this soul will carry energetically into body this tendency to defer to the wishes of others with the intention of healing it. Now. Let's say arbitrarily that this soul is incarnating as a female, no sexism intended. Let's say also that there's another soul in that soul's soul group who has the opposite tendency. This is somebody who in many past lives ran roughshod over others, dominated people inappropriately. That person would see in their life review that they had that tendency and they would also be motivated to heal it. So this soul carries into body energetically the tendency to dominate others, not for the purpose of expressing it, but in the hope, the intention that it will be healed, that they will learn to respect others. And let's say arbitrarily this soul is incarnating as a male, again, no sexism intended. So the soul incarnating as the female would be aware of the pre-birth intention of the soul incarnating as the male. And she could go to him and say, hey, I'm taking into body this tendency to defer to the wishes of others. I see that you're taking into body the opposite tendency, the tendency to dominate others. Why don't you and I make a pre-birth plan to marry, say, around the age of 30? And our hope is that I will learn to stand up for myself and you will learn to respect the wishes of others. Now, they know this is going to be a turbulent marriage, but they're willing to take that on hmm. in the hope of learning what they want to learn. So that's the pre-birth plan. Yep. Now, let's say that the woman, when she's about 25 years old, she gets a job with an employer who is running roughshod over her treating her with a lack of gentleness and respect and kindness. And let's say also that she summons the internal resources and she makes a stand. She says to him, stop, you may not treat me this way. If you want me to keep working here, you must treat me with respect and kindness. In the moment the woman makes a stand like that, there's a tremendous increase in her vibration, which if she sustains the increased vibration until she's age 30, now one of two things will happen. Either she and the man she planned to marry will never meet because by virtue of the law of attraction, her vibration is much higher than his and so they never come together. Or if they do meet, 
They're not interested in each other. They have one date and nothing happens, again, because of the law of attraction. Their vibrations are so different. So in this hypothetical, the woman has utilized her free will to learn the pre-birth lesson, which in turn obviates the need for the plan to challenge the marriage. And so it simply never happens. That's how pre-birth planning and free will intersect in a very elegant uh, sort of way. Wow. I couldn't. I couldn't think of a better example. Uh, it's perfect and 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 hopeful. You know what I mean. I think it gives people a lot of hope. I, I think one of the things that can happen when you start talking about pre-birth planning is, um, is 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 this dismal feeling, like you don't have any control over your life, and yet. And yet that is not your message. Uh, in fact, that's the opposite of your message, I, I think. You know, and, and, and I, I, should, I should mention, you know, people will read about it uh, in your book. But I, I should mention that, that this, work is, this work started with you. You started, this is your own story. You had your own things that you needed to overcome, correct? Yeah, that's absolutely true. I, I come from an abuse background myself. And for many, many years, I felt victimized by that. I couldn't understand why it had happened. I didn't see any deeper meaning or purpose in it. Um, I was on a healing path, but I wasn't healing in the way that I wanted to. And so it was really a very personal search for meaning, for purpose, for answers, for healing. And we talked a little bit about this uh, in another conversation, but I'll, I'll just share it since it's relevant now. Um, this, this path of seeking answers, very personal answers, led me to see a medium. This was back in uh, 2003. I had never been to, to see a medium before. I wasn't sure I believed in it. Uh, mediumship was not part of my background. But I was on this healing path and I was looking for answers. And so in this session with the medium, she channeled my spirit guides. They introduced me to this idea of pre-birth planning. And they said, you planned your biggest challenges, including this abusive background that I came from. Well, you can imagine this, this was a, a paradigm-shattering revelation for me. And it caused me to completely open up and consider, well, could, could this possibly be true? Could it, could it be that I myself agreed to have that experience? And, and if I did, what the heck was I thinking, you know? Mm. Well, it... it as I now know and believe, I did agree to that experience. And we don't need to go into the details for it. It has to do with very complex karmic relationships with the others who were involved. Yeah. But I understand now that that part of my background was set up for the purpose of healing. On the surface, it would appear from a human perspective simply to be a meaningless, painful experience. But on a soul level experience, it's a catalyst toward profound healing. It is. And, and what's cool about it i mean you have lots of stories but but you're one of the stories and 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 the result of this healing is what like what does this do for your life how does it change you uh you mentioned a little bit you know you, you talked about going from victimhood you know uh, you know to to meaning that sort of a thing but you personally how did it change you well, in, in a number of different ways. It helped me to forgive uh, people who I feel or used to feel had mistreated me in the past. Um, another thing that it does is that uh, one thing I see again and again in the work for the books that I wrote is that, uh, you know, there, there's uh, an understanding that karma refers to the ties that bind. That's actually the meaning of the word karma. And ties here refers to emotional ties, which are unresolved from past lives or might be left unresolved from the current lifetime. Uh, the most common sort of emotional tie that binds people together who keep reincarnating with each other is a lack of forgiveness. One person does something to another, that person can't forgive them, and the lack of forgiveness prompts the two souls to come back into body and continue playing out these sort of karmic dramas in the hope uh, at the soul level that finally forgiveness will be attained. Well, if you know that you yourself planned your life prior to birth, then you can take responsibility for the things that happen. It doesn't mean that you blame or criticize yourself. It simply means that you acknowledge that you are the powerful creator of all you experience. Mm. Once you take responsibility in that way, it makes it a lot easier to forgive other people. So the way this affects my life now is that if something comes up and someone treats me in a way in which I feel anger or blame or resentment toward them, I will think, 
to myself, all right, I don't want to carry a lack of forgiveness for this person into the next lifetime and have to replay certain karmic dialogues. Mm. So it makes me much more focused on getting to that place of forgiveness. Now, having said this, I, I want to add a very important point here. You know, when we talk about forgiveness, I think it's important for people to understand that you don't want to start saying to yourself, I must forgive, or I should forgive, or I have to forgive. That kind of language, when you talk to yourself in terms of need to, have to, should to, ought to, that is the language of the ego. Your mind will talk to you that way, but your soul won't. Your soul communicates with you through loving impulses. When you start saying to yourself, I've got to forgive this person, or I'll have to reincarnate with them, <laughs> that is... That is a contracted energetic state, and it won't allow you to forgive the person because you don't for create forgiveness as an act of will. You create it through intention. Now, you'll say to me, what's the difference? Is an intention an expression of will? No, it's not, and here's the difference. Let's say that I have a bow and arrow, and my objective is to shoot the arrow into the center of an archery target. Can I will the arrow to hit the center of the target? No, I cannot. Can I intend for the arrow to hit the center of the target? Yes, of course I can. Feel the difference between those two things. One is a contracted energetic state. The other one has a, a lot more gentleness and kindness towards self. That's how you create forgiveness, through a gentle, kind intention, not through cracking a whip over yourself and saying, I have to forgive. Mm -hmm. That won't work. Wow. Um... Well, right there. I mean, that's a really profound statement, and, and you could apply that to so many different things in life. And I think so, so many of us can look back and think of times when we tried to will something, and, and, and it just made a mess of it. Whereas if you could sort of surrender and allow, allow it to happen uh, in the way that you described um, through intention, it, it's a completely different experience and more likely that you're going to get what it is that you want. Uh, I even see, I've seen the same thing with people who, you know, we were talking about the law of attraction, who have sort of tried to follow the law of attraction, we'll just say for material gain. And they did all the things, they did it all, but because they were just sort of following steps and it wasn't so much of an intention as they were trying to force something to happen. Um, by following these steps that are supposed to lead to something, they didn't have the same results as those people who really understood what the law of att attraction is all about and, were, and, and, and how that's related to this idea of intention and then use that for thing, to make things happen, you know. Um, but uh, perfect. And I have to say, every time I thought of a question, um, you you were able to explain that immediately right after I wrote forgiveness here and then boom, you went right into forgiveness. Uh, I don't need to ask questions. I just need to get you talking and then <laughs> you're going to answer all the questions that people have out there. Uh, so beautifully said. Um, I, I need to go back a little bit. You had said, and I, cause I, th this was one of them that I don't want people to misunderstand. You had said if, if people take on too much and I think so many of our audience you know, do think, geez, maybe I took on too much in this lifetime. You know what I mean? But you talked about if you take on too much, sometimes the life will end because the soul recognizes that it's not going to be able to accomplish what it came here. To uh, what do you mean by that? Could we? Could you just expand on that a little bit more? I mean, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to die, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you know whatever they should commit suicide. Um, what? What? Um, what? What did you mean by that? How? How is it? I understand that the soul could decide that they're not going to be able to make that happen, but go further than that, than, than what we sort of just covered very lightly. Well, there, there are basically two circumstances under which a physical incarnation would come to an end. One is if the soul concludes that it will not be able to do what it came here to do, and we talked about that. And again, I want to emphasize there's no judgment on the part of the soul that's not viewed as a bad, as a bad thing. And in fact, the soul's attitude, uh, simply put, is, okay, let's try again. And there's, there's really no, no judgment beyond that. Um, the second, second circumstance under which an incarnation ends is that the soul has accomplished what it came here to do. Now, some people, after they've accomplished what they came here to do, the incarnation does not end because they continue on in a capacity of service to others. This theme of service to others is something that runs through every single pre-birth planning session we looked at 
every single one had souls talking about their intention to be of service to one another and to the earth as a whole. So very often a soul will accomplish what it came here to do and its portion for its soul is done, but it will continue on in body and service to others. Uh, these are the main reasons why an incarnation comes to an end. Now, one thing that happens in the pre-birth planning is that different exit points are set up. An exit point is a point at which something will happen or some set of circumstances will occur that makes it possible for the soul to take its energy out of the physical body. For example, in my first book, Your Soul's Plan, uh, in the chapter on death of a loved one, it's a story of a woman, Valerie, who plans prior to birth to lose her only child, uh, who dies in a seemingly accidental drug overdose, and she also plans prior to birth to lose her fiancé, who dies in a, a diving accident. He was a commercial diver. So working with one, one of the mediums, uh, who are my colleagues, we talked to, to uh, the former fiancé. His name is D.C. And we said to D.C., uh, you know, tell us about your death, the diving accident, what was planned prior to birth. And one of the things he said was, he talks about his different exit points. The diving accident was only one of them. And I said, well, what were the others? And he said, well, one could have been a motorcycle accident. Then he lists several others that I don't specifically recall right now. Yeah. Everybody has these. They're all part of a pre-birth plan. These are the points in your life in which your soul has anticipated either that you will have accomplished what you wanted to, or if you're not accomplishing what you came in to do, this would be an opportunity to leave the physical body. But again, there's absolutely no judgment about that if it happens. Yeah. And if someone does not accomplish what they came here to do, I know there's a belief out there that, that people are going to then, some believe that very quickly you're going to have another incarnation and, and, and have to go through the exact same experiences all over again. Um, first of all, you know, the first answer to that is it depends on the person. You know what I mean? Uh, it depends on the situation. But how would you answer that to someone who has this belief that, oh, I didn't accomplish it here, so that means I'm going to have to come back and do it all over again? Well, it depends on what you mean by do it all over again. Um, it, it's not so much that you are planning to have specific experiences, but rather, as we talked about earlier, that you want to learn certain lessons. You want to cultivate and express certain divine virtues. So you can do that through many, many different types of life plans, many, many different kinds of experiences, and the experiences don't have to be challenges. You can learn to cultivate and express these qualities through loving, joyful experience as well. So you may be a soul who, in your life review... Oh. Okay. I think we lost you there, Robert. Hold on. How you'd like to do it through loving, joyful experience. And so you plan a different, a completely different type of life for yourself. It doesn't have to be through challenge. Okay. Um, one of the things that I also like about this book, and I'm just going to sort of jump ahead because we are running out of time, is that in the first book you talked a lot about challenges. And in this book you actually talk about this idea of spiritual awakenings. Why don't we just start with, can you define what, what a spiritual awakening is in, in, in your mind? Spiritual awakening to me means that a person comes to know, not just believe, but actually comes to know in a very uh, visceral, felt kind of way, that they are more than the physical body, more than the personality, more than their thoughts, more than their emotions. Um, the physical body, the personality, the thoughts, and the emotions these are all things you have while you're in an incarnation. These are things you carry. But just because you have something, that doesn't mean you are the thing you have. To, t to give a very simple example, let's say that you have a horse. Well, that doesn't mean that you are a horse. So by the same token, just because you have a body, you have a personality, you have thoughts, you have feelings, that doesn't mean you are any of those things you're not. These are things you have or carry during the lifetime. But who you really are is a holy, eternal, courageous soul, a being who very bravely planned to leave, at least in your perceptions, a realm of love and light and peace and joy to come into body and have great challenges in order to cultivate and express certain divine virtues. So when you come into a visceral knowing of that, that to me is a spiritual awakening. Wow. Um, do, do, we, do we strive, does a soul, 
strive for a spiritual awakening in every in every lifetime? Not in every lifetime, but the topic of spiritual awakening is particularly relevant to the current era because this is, I believe, a time of widespread, worldwide, in fact, spiritual awakening. And so you have many, many souls all over the world who did plan for a spiritual awakening as part of this lifetime. I'll share an interesting story with you. Somebody I interviewed for my first book, whose story actually didn't end up in the book, is a woman who's now in her 40s. And a number of years ago, when she was in her 20s, she and her daughter, who I believe was about seven at that time, were at a swimming pool during the summer. This woman was lying in a lounge chair in the sun. Her daughter was playing in the pool. Well, all of a sudden, the girl jumped up out of the swimming pool, ran over to her mother, and mind you, this is a child who previously had never said anything unusual. She ran over to her mother and said, you're not waking up the way you and I planned before we were born, so you're going to have to have a really bad accident. <laughs> well, you can imagine that the mother was aghast. Yeah. Partly the daughter was speaking in such an odd way, and partly the content of what was being said. In any case, shortly thereafter, the mother had an auto accident, oh. which did not trigger a spiritual awakening. A year or so later, she had an even worse auto accident, which did not trigger a spiritual awakening. And a year or so later, she had a third and even worse auto accident, which finally triggered a spiritual awakening. This is an example of somebody who planned an awakening before birth, planned to awaken through the experience of an accident, if need be, and planned actually multiple accidents, if need be, and that was the case here. Now, <clears throat> in sharing this story, I don't want anybody to respond to it in fear. That's not my intention. That's actually the opposite of my intention. But what I do want to share is, is an awareness that very often people will notice that a certain type of challenge keeps coming back around in their life, and every time it comes back, it's a little bit more intense. If you notice that kind of pattern in your life, this is something to pay very close attention to because it's very likely to be part of a pre-birth plan and it's your soul trying to get your attention. You know, when I interviewed people for my books, people who had that kind of experience with something coming back again and again in increasingly intense form, it was interesting. They would always use the same expression. They would say to me, the universe hit me over the head with a cosmic two by four. I heard that again and again from people who had an experience like the woman who had the three auto accidents. Yeah. If you feel that the universe has hit you over the head with a cosmic two by four, pay very close attention to what the underlying lesson may be, whether it's a spiritual awakening or something else, because this is your pre-birth plan in action and it's your soul trying to get your attention. And the other way around that, because you did talk about if we do certain things, it'll change our vibration, so some, some, these things won't be needed. And that's sort of what the daughter was referring to. You needed it because you didn't wake up the way you wanted to. Um, uh, and so she had these things happen. And what would, what would be some of the ways that, um, that people could intentionally wake themselves up? Well, I think one way, one way to intentionally wake up is simply to first understand that you are an eternal soul coming into body for the purpose of learning certain things, cultivating and expressing certain qualities, and then go about cultivating and expressing those qualities in a very conscious manner. You know, the universe uses pain as a learning mechanism, as a teaching mechanism, which means that it's optional. If you're learning on your own, you don't need the pain to prompt you to look for the underlying lesson. So let's say that you do the divine virtues exercise or you simply conclude on your own that you're in body in this lifetime to learn kindness. Then you set the intention to nurture kindness within yourself. Well, how do you do that? It's really very simple. You simply note when you're kind to other people and then internally you applaud yourself, you celebrate it every time you do it. This is like planting seeds. You're planting seeds of kindness and you are nurturing them by applauding yourself every time you express kindness. And so in this way, over a period of time, kindness grows. You become a more kind person. If you're cultivating kindness in a very conscious manner like that, then you're not going to need these more painful catalysts to get you to look at why you're here in body. Uh, it sort of goes along that idea. We've all heard sort of the phrase, uh, you know, it's not what happens to you. It's how you react to what happens to you that matters. And what you said very early on uh, today is, you know, if we come from a place of love, that's that's sort of the goal, to come from a place of love rather than fear. Um, what could you say about that, you know, before we sort of wrap things up here? 
Sorry, Bob, I lost the connection there for a second. Oh, you what did? Yeah, question? okay, that happened with you a minute ago. Can you hear me now? No. I can. Okay. I do. I do. Let's, let's leave everybody with a message about, about love versus fear, about, about reacting to the things that happen to them from a place of love. If that doesn't come naturally for them, for instance, how might someone go about doing that? I think the way to, to come from a place of love, I think there are a couple of things you can do. One is uh, quite simply pray and ask in your prayers to God or source, all that is, however you conceive of a higher power. Ask to, for assistance in coming from a place of love rather than a place of fear. Prayer is, is a very, very powerful tool for accomplishing pretty much anything you would want to accomplish. And I'm not sure that we actually understand how prayer works. I believe that when you pray and ask for divine assistance in being a more loving person, it has the effect of calling light, non-physical light, uh, into your consciousness, into your being. And then the light, in ways that are beyond human comprehension currently, actually assists you in being a more loving person. So prayer is one way to go about this. The second way, I think, to, to come from love rather than fear is to meditate. Meditation is an ages-old tool uh, it's in all the major religions, and it's just a tremendously, tremendously powerful tool. Because regardless of the form of meditation you practice, what it will do for you is that it allows you to witness fear. So everybody's heard about become the witness, cultivate the attitude of the witness. This is tremendously powerful, because then when fear arises within you, instead of, instead of reacting to it, instead of allowing it to make decisions for you, you just observe it, you note it. You watch it float by like you would watch a dark cloud float by on the horizon, and you don't react to it. The fact of the matter is that fear makes very poor decisions. So if you are identified with your fear, meaning you don't know how to witness it, then fear is going to make very bad decisions for you. And this is how people end up calling more challenges into their life. Hmm. But if you can witness fear, and you learn to do that through meditation, then you can consciously choose to come from a place of love. Prayer and meditation are the two big tools, in my view. Great, great examples. Uh, I've certainly experienced that in my life. If I'm having a bad day, it just seems to get worse and worse. Um, you know, the great manifester of good and bad, right? Um, and, and then I, I recognize it. I become a witness to it, and I go, whoa, you know, I just, I got I to gotta change everything. I got to change the way I'm thinking. I got to change my fear. I got to change. And, and that works, and it turns things around for you. And the other way is true as well. Having a great day, you know, just great things just keep happening. And I witness that as well and think, I want to keep this going as long as I can, you know. I mean, and you try to make a conscious effort to do that. Um, you know, uh, just in wrapping up here, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, amazing, absolutely amazing. And if people are enjoying this interview and the last one, I highly encourage, highly encourage them to read both of your books, Your Soul's Plan. This one's Your Soul's Gift. Uh, they can see the cover in the other video to your first book. Um, the two go together. They can change someone's life by reading one of them, two of them, even more so. The other thing is you start, you're now working with people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, one of the things that you've added to working with mediums and channels is hypnotherapy work. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the, the way this developed is that after my first book came out, for a period of years, people were contacting me and saying, I'd like to know what my pre-birth plan is. Can you tell me what it is? And there was no way that I personally could help them to answer that question. And I simply suggested work with the mediums and channels in the book. But then I realized there actually is a way that I can help people get at this kind of information themselves. And that is through hypnotherapeutic regression. So I studied hypnotherapy, was certified by the International Between Lives Regression Network, and now offer two types of regression sessions. Uh, one is called a past life soul regression, and the other is a between lives soul regression. And in both of these, the client has the opportunity to come in the knowing of their pre-birth plan, to talk with their spirit guide or loved ones who are back in spirit, and ask any questions they want to. In the past life soul regression, we take the client back to a past life that explains the plan, the intention for the current lifetime. And then when they exit the physical body at the end of that past life and go into spirit, then they have the opportunity generally to talk with the spirit guide or loved one and ask any questions they have about the life plan or anything else that's of interest to them. 
Now, between live soul regression is a much longer session. It's a much deeper kind of trance. It contains an abbreviated past life regression, the sole purpose of which is to get the person into spirit, into the non-physical realm. And then at that point, any number of things can happen. Some people will go to the Akashic Record and be shown their book of lives, which is the complete record of all lives they've ever lived. Some people go to classrooms on the other side and they see souls preparing for the upcoming lifetime. Some people have reunions with their soul group, which is a very loving and joyful kind of experience. But the primary intention is to get the person in front of what is called the Council of Elders. The Council consists of the very wise and highly evolved and loving beings who oversee the cycle of reincarnation on planet Earth. If the person gets in front of the Council of Elders, this is a potentially transformative experience because the Council knows everything there is to know about their life plan and everything else about them. They can ask any question on any subject and if it's for their highest good, they'll receive an answer. So it, it's a potentially life-changing experience. And through these two types of regressions, uh, the client can access information about the life plan on their own without having to rely on anybody else. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. I've had both of those experiences, not with you. I wish I had them with you. Uh, the other ones were great, but I just can't imagine how much better it would have been to have those with you. I did meet uh, with the Council of Elders. Oh, my God, the love, uh, the unconditional love that I just felt from them. Whew, I'll, I'll never forget what that felt like. Amazing. Um, so I highly recommend that experience or the, both of those experiences for anybody. Um, also, I will mention that uh, on your website, which is yoursoulsplan.com, correct? That's correct. Yoursoulsplan.com. Um, there are, are all the chapters, uh, available s as, as singly by themselves? Yes, every, every chapter from the current book, the new book, Your Soul's yep. Gift, is available as a standalone ebook, as well as four chapters from the first book, Your Soul's Plan. That's great. So if they're trying to just find something that relates to what they're going through, they can go there and they can choose one and just read that as That's sort of right. a preamble. My guess is they're going to read that and they're going to want to buy you know, both books anyways. Uh, and any events coming up for you, Robert? Uh, in April, I'll be speaking at a spiritual study center in Taiwan, uh, if anybody from Taiwan has tuned in. In May, I'll be at the Infinity Foundation in Chicago. Uh, in December, I'll be back at Kripalu in western Massachusetts. Nice. So those are a few of the things coming up. All right. Everything on your website? Everything is on the website. All right, yoursoulsplan.com. Uh, we'll put the links below as well so people just uh, can find out about those events that you talked about. And uh, once again, uh, it's been amazing. It's, it's been enlightening. Uh, it, it's like a spiritual awakening itself. So, <laughs> see, people are already having that spiritual awakening. Rob, uh, thanks so much. You know how much I appreciate you being here, and it's, it's always a pleasure. You're welcome, Bob. It's a pleasure and an honor for me. All right. Bye now. Bye-bye.